This is Charles Hedry coming to you from Camel's Hill Baptist Church. We are in our Bible study in the book of Philippians. Now we're coming down toward the end of this chapter. We are now getting ready to enter chapter 4, the last chapter of this study and of Paul's message to the church at Philippi. Last time we uh, listened to what Paul had to, to say about how we are to walk with Jesus Christ faithfully every day, keeping our eyes focused on Him, but being aware that the enemy is lurking nearby and wants to lead us astray. So now we come to the chapter 4 as he brings this letter down to a conclusion. And today we are going to be looking at chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. I've titled this part of this text, Lay aside your personal differences. Now, Paul is writing a letter that is really a letter of encouragement to the church. But sometimes when you try to encourage people, you have to also help them identify some of the reason they need encouragement. And in this case, with the church at Philippi, there were a few little issues going on that Paul knew if they were going to be encouraged in the Lord and they were going to do the Lord's work the way the Lord wanted it done, there were a few little things that had to be straightened out. And so when we start reading here in chapter 4, verse 1, you're going to see that Paul hits the, the bullseye right in the middle and tackles this problem uh, right off without hesitation. So turn with me to chapter 4. Begin reading in verse 1 through 9. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, uh, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Now here it comes. I plead with Eroda, and I plead with Sintche, to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fella, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all people. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Now this portion of scripture uh, might be difficult for uh, some to deal with. I know and many of you know perhaps that I've had some health issues uh, in recent uh, months and, and I've gone through some things that have uh, caused me to think about a lot of things and there's portions of this passage that I've had to personally deal with and am dealing with right now. So I'm not telling you something that is going to be brand new even to myself. It's kind of like the preacher is preaching to the preacher as well this morning. But how many churches and Christians do you know that have some kind of problem? Churches have problems within the church. Church members have problems with other church members. What about families that have problems? Friends, if any believer in Christ has a problem with a fellow believer, if any church has situations that cause disunity, 
and destructive spirit in that body. That Christian and that church is in a spiritual problem with the Lord. Sometimes even minor problems not dealt with can lead to major problems and can affect an entire church family. Most of our church problems, I feel, are not as much doctrinal problems as they are personality and attitude problems. And I think Paul is going to try to deal with some of that in this text. I read of a church that built a beautiful building. But since a family made the largest financial gift to that church to build it, it was seen as a family memorial. Everything in the church was the finest money could buy. The church was dedicated. Later on, some women in the church decided they wanted to add an electric potato peeler in the kitchen. There were other women in the church who got upset over it. As time went on, the church became divided over the potato peeler. The pastor was so upset over this trivial matter he talked about resigning. When a fellow pastor asked him why he wanted to resign, he said, Every Sunday, as I stand to preach God's word, sitting before me are two groups of people who hate each other. This so upsets me that I cannot preach the sermon God has laid on my heart because all I see are the potato peeler group and the anti-potato peeler group. Their minds are focused on nothing else. Sad. Ephroditus, Paul's friend in the ministry from the church at Philippi, had come to, to Rome where Paul was in prison and to tell Paul there were some issues that was upsetting a lot of people in the church. And so he shares with Paul these problems and feelings that were being hurt by fellow church members, getting angry with each other, being unforgiving toward one another. It was dividing the church. They had lost their unity. They had lost their focus. And people were leaving the church, going other places. The future of the church that Paul and others had started some time ago was being threatened. The future did not look good. It's a familiar story we hear over and over in some places today. So Paul's going to address the problem. It so happens the problem here at Philippi was between two women in the church that was affecting the whole church. So Paul sends a message in the text that I read to you. And in that text, he makes three main points. That churches and individual believers uh, need to listen to, take heed of, and do something about if they are a part of that situation. So here it is. Number one, the problems in the church are spiritual problems. These kinds of problems are spiritual problems. He describes this in the first three verses. Paul starts out his message by identifying the church as my brothers. He's addressing the whole body. He's not addressing just two women. He's addressing the whole body, the whole church, the whole family. My brothers, church, you have a serious problem. Notice what he said next. He says, I, Paul, love the church. Not individuals as such in the church, though he did. But he loved the body of Christ, the fellowship of Christ. Paul loves all of the members of the church. He sees the church as a part of his crown and glory because he helped establish Christ's witness in the city of Philippi. So he was proud of, of their success up to this point. But this church, like churches sometimes today, that have a proud history 
of God working in their lives and in the life of that church in the community in the past seem to be losing that in the life of the church and community today because it's a spiritual problem. So Paul addresses the whole church family. But even more, I believe Paul is speaking a word to those members who are creating some of the problems spiritually among the leadership in that church. So his challenge to them is simply this. Stand firm in the Lord. In other words, don't let minor problems become major problems. Don't try sweeping them under the carpet and hoping they'll just go away. They can destroy the church before you realize what's happened. That's why he said previously, keep your eye on the enemy because he's there, he's working. Paul doesn't want anyone in this church, be it who it is, two women or who it might be, to create such a devastating spiritual problem that affects the whole church. He doesn't want to see that, and neither do you and I. So he says to the church, church, don't let it happen. Don't sit there and do nothing and say nothing. Speak up. Stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop it right now, in other words. Your spiritual leaders are to show spiritual leadership in their lives. So straighten this problem out before it destroys the witness of Christ in your community, before they lose God's power, before any more lives are hurt and destroyed or driven away from the Lord in the church. So Paul starts out by dealing with the problem by saying to the spiritual leaders in that church, stand up for the truth. Be on fire for the Lord. Get this problem straightened out. Lead by example, spiritual leaders, and how we need that desperately in our churches today. And then Paul actually deals with these two women in the church who had a disagreement, and he had something to say about those two women. He said to them directly, Lay aside your differences, ladies, for the sake of Christ and the growth of his church. Lay it aside. Don't get hung up on it. Let's examine what Paul said to these two quarreling women in verse 2. Two women in this church had major differences of opinion, and they were quarreling among themselves. That's not unusual for people to have different opinions. But the, 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 the problem was it was dividing the church. It was splitting the church up. People were taking sides. And it will happen almost every time when it's not dealt with. Some people were fed up. They were just leaving the church altogether. And that's generally what will happen. And you see a decline in your church. This church was in the state of dying and declining. No longer a growing church. No longer a spiritual church. That their fellowship of unity in the church was destroyed by two women who couldn't agree on something in the church. The major problem had become the, the, their attitude toward each other, which affected the whole church. Paul, Paul already addressed previously the spiritual leaders in the church that it's time to step up and stand up and solve these problems and move on and do the work of the Lord. So he dresses these two women and their ungodly attitudes. They need to lay them aside, the differences. Get on the same page with the church and God's will for this church. In other words, you two ladies that don't agree with each other, learn to get along with each other. You get along with each other in the Lord. And when the Lord is not in that equation, then you can't get along with each other. Put aside your differences. Put aside ungodly attitudes. You're hurting the whole church. Paul is saying in, in the members of this church, there needs to be some spiritual changes going on. 
we would say today they just need to have a good old-fashioned revival. So Paul spares no words, shows no favoritism. He simply says, repent of your sins and get right with God and then get right with each other. He goes on to say this church had a wonderful past in verse 3. God had blessed them and used them to spread the gospel. Many people had been saved. But these ungodly attitudes can and will destroy all that's already been done if the matter is ignored and laid aside. We can sense a little disappointment in Paul's spirit. These women had worked with him when he started that church. They were once faithful servants of God. And so Paul pleads with them not to let little differences continue to rip this church apart. Paul wants this church to be a great church like it once was. And, and there are many churches like this today. We pray that our church could become a great church, and we often say, like we used to be. Well, if we've let these things come in, they are tearing us apart. I ran across something that someone wrote, and I don't know who wrote it, but it's entitled, What Makes a Great Church? And this is what they wrote. Not soft seats or beautiful lighting, but strong, courageous leadership. Not sweet tones of the organ, but sweet personalities that reflect Jesus. Not a tall steeple with beautiful chimes and bells, but a godly vision for the lost people around them. Not their big budgets, but their big hearts willing to give. Not a larger amount of money to give, but greater services and ministries to people who are in need. Not a larger membership, but the presence of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Not what we did in the past, but what we are doing right now and what God is going to lead us to do in the future. Church, let's grow the church with the right spirit and attitude. So that was Paul's desire for this church. This is what Jesus wants for your church and, your, and mine and for my life and your life. We can disagree without becoming so disagreeable that we begin to hate one another. We can get along with each other. Paul writes from his heart that they not allow Satan to work among them and destroy the witness of this church in its community. The second thing here Paul says, the church can only succeed when there's peace and unity. We talk about this all the time in churches. We need peace and unity. We need harmony in the church. The first step to peace and unity in the church starts with true repentance of sin in the heart of the people. Paul said to the church, rejoice in the Lord. Now how can you do that if there is sin in our hearts toward each other? We can't rejoice in the Lord. We, we will harbor resentment. We will carry unforgiveness. We will show our sinful attitudes. So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. That means get the problem straightened out. And it comes through repentance, being forgiving of one another. Rejoice in the Lord for all that he's done and all that he's going to do. It's like putting a glove on your hand. They go together, the Lord and his people. Think about the word peace. He said, let there be peace in the church. Peace is always connected to having a right attitude, especially in the church family. Some churches have lost the peace. Consequently, there is not much to rejoice about in that church. The church needs to regain its peace. Then we can have a song in our heart. Then we can work together as the family of God. Then we can minister to one another and reach out to souls who need the Lord and minister to people who have great needs. But when peace among the membership is missing or lacking, the church, listen to me, the church is in heart failure and needs to be revived. In my illness, 
I went through several times of heart failure. I had to be revived back. Many churches are in heart failure right now. Paul goes on and dresses these two disputing women to be a little more gentle with each other. Many churches today have lost their gentleness. They've lost their passion. They've allowed disruptive attitudes to take over. This bragging, this attitude, Paul says, needs to be cast down. Humility needs to be rising up. Self-centeredness needs to be replaced with compassion and love for one another. Paul reminds this church, the reason is the Lord is near. He's coming back. He's coming sooner than you think. Jesus knows what's going on in your heart and mind. He knows what's going on in your church and my church, how we treat one another, the things that we say that sometimes hurt each other. He knows every unkind word spoken, every ungodly attitude we carry. And God knows that that kind of sinning will disrupt the whole family of God and take our focus off of God and His plan for His people and puts the focus on us and usually puts it on us individually. Verse 6, Paul said, a divided church needs to experience revival. Make some new commitments. Make some new changes that need to be dealt with. If the church is going to impact the world around us, like Jesus said we are to do, we must depend on the power of the Holy Spirit of God to control our hearts, to control our lives, to control our attitudes. When this is missing, then the church begins to experience anxiety. It begins to lose the peace and the unity and its spirit among its members. And so Paul gives them the first step to restoration, revival, repentance, the change of the heart, the changing of life. Paul says it comes by prayer. Coming to God in prayer, asking for forgiveness and a change in your own life. It seems so simple, doesn't it? But here's the problem. Not many believers are true praying believers. We go through the motions. Likewise, not many churches really want to experience revival because you have to go through changes if you experience revival. But it all starts in prayer. Paul said when the church experiences spiritual uh, uh, experiences problems, they are spiritual. But he reminds the church that we cannot be effective at all if peace and unity and harmony is missing. And then the final thing Paul says here in the first part of chapter 4, God promises revival, restoration to any who will repent of their sin, be it an individual person, or two or three people, or a whole church family. In verses 7 through 9, a heart and a life of a believer that is out of God's will is disrupted to the plan of God. When this affects the church family, the whole church gets out of God's will and plan. This is a serious spiritual problem. It creates troubled relationships between church members. It doesn't take a whole community to realize something's wrong in a church that is missing harmony and unity and peace. Such a church can be overwhelmed and quickly move into decline. In the midst of this, God makes us a promise, though, to his church that if we're willing to repent, he's ready to forgive us and to restore us. People in the church who are at odds with each other must rediscover the peace of God before there can truly be a revival or restoration of spiritual living. Paul reminds this church what repentance really means. That God in repentance, God is going to guard our hearts and our minds from these attitudes, from these things that would destroy us. 
This means that God will bring us back into his, his will and he will put in us a new spirit. I'm telling you when a church is out of the will of God and, and has an experience of restoration with God, God brings a spirit back into that church and it becomes more alive than it's ever been. I don't know about you, but I pray that for my church and I hope you're praying that for your church. There are many churches today that are troubled they want this restoration, but it does not come by our efforts or our lack of efforts. It comes only when God changes our hearts, changes our attitude, changes our will. And Paul says, when God does this, it will transcend the understanding of everybody. You will be amazed at what God can do in your life, in your church. The community will be amazed what's going on in that church. God is there. Man, he's at work. People are being saved. Christians are being discipled. I want to be a part of that kind of a church. We will be amazed how God will work when we truly repent of our sins. That's his promise. Paul concludes in verses 8 and 9 here that all of us want our church to be on fire for the Lord. This will happen when God's people get on fire for God. Paul is, says not only must God change our hearts, but we must also work to change our minds, to change our thinking, our thoughts and attitudes. Paul is speaking to the brothers in Christ, those who know Christ. It includes men and women, young adults, believers, children, everybody. If you want to see the truth prevail, if you want to see things done right in the church, if you want to see love and peace, unity and harmony dominate in your life and in your church, if you want God to use your church to advance his kingdom in this community, we'd better get our minds focused on God and off of each other or it won't happen. Paul says, if we learn anything, as God's church, about the spirit and the power of God in the life of his people, we need to realize that we have, for whatever we think, drifted away from God and from his will in our personal lives, and a spiritual problem has now developed. Thus, in the life of the church, individually and collectively, it is now time for us to put into daily practice what we are in Christ and who he wants us to be in him. This puts the church in a whole new realm, in a whole new light in the community and throughout the world. The church is one of the most disrespected institutions on the face of the earth right now. It should not be that way. If we are revived, restored in our walk with God, then Paul says, then the peace of God will prevail. It will be with you. There seems to be this spiritual problem in many places today. Members that don't get along with one another. And it affects the whole church. And, in, and usually the problems that affect one church spills over and affects other churches because sometimes people leave churches and they take their spiritual problem into a new church and then there are new spiritual problems in that church. It comes down to repenting of our sins and trusting Jesus Christ to live out his will and purpose in my life and in the life of my church that his name will be made known around the world. And people will be saved. People will be born again. People will become disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. Going into all the world, making disciples for Jesus. Is that your prayer? It's mine. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you will help our churches become like what Paul is describing here. A church that has been revived, revitalized set on fire for Jesus Christ and souls will be saved 
and disciples will be trained. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.